Today's a special day. I leaned over at my wife in the first service this morning and realizing that um, Calvary Church was birthed. We, Kathy and I, and some of you, very few, but some of you were here on the first day of Calvary, which happened to be Easter Sunday. Church growth specialist told me later, you can't start a new church on Easter, but I, nobody told me. I didn't know it, and we did, and, uh, and uh, we're on April 16th, 1995 was our first service, Easter Sunday. And, uh, and so that means we're starting next month, starting the beginning of our 30th year. But this is our 30th Easter service as a congregation, as a church. <laughs> and um, I'm older. It happens. The verses we're going to read in Acts chapter 2 are a, is really a message being preached by the Apostle Peter as he explains the resurrection of Jesus to the Lord's church who were in Israel after the Holy Spirit filled those who were in the upper room. And Peter is ministering now to this church. The, the church age has been birthed. And now those people who, he's preaching to many of those people who a few days before were crying, crucify him, were fickled. They were waving palm branches one minute, and the next minute they were crying, crucify him. And now Peter is preaching to them who Jesus died for them, even though they cried, crucify. He died for the very ones who wanted to put him on the cross. Peter's preaching this message to the newly formed church of which many of us are a part of today. And Peter preaches, in, starting in verse 22, people of Israel, listen. <laughs> I wonder what Peter was like. I mean, you know, what, what was that like? Here's Peter standing up. The Holy Spirit is poured out, and he's saying to these dear ones, listen to me. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him. As you well know, he's speaking, speaking to people who well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, and you who nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God, oh, I'm, I'm always thankful when I see, but God. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death, Peter says, could not keep him in its grip. You can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good man down. And now... In verse 25, Peter uses King David's conversation with God. I'll get to that in a minute, but, you know, we realize Jesus couldn't be held down. Death couldn't keep him. Isn't that good news? And I'm his child. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says, now dwells in me. That means, yeah, I'm getting older. Kathy, I was 34 when we started Calvary. Do the math. <laughs> Some of you, I've known you for a while. If you think you're not getting older, just go look at a picture of you 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Oh, I know. Some of you are doing a great job. You're aging so well. You're still going to die. 
this body is not going to live forever. You're dying every day. This is Resurrection Sunday. We're celebrating life, and here I am telling you, you're dying. <laughs> you're going down. But to a child of the king, to a child of God, death can't hold us. I ran into this guy that tried to tell me that if you have enough faith, you're not going to die. I just put my arm around him and said, you're nuts. He was bald. His hair already left him. <laughs> you know, there's coming a day for those who trust in the Lord. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. We're going to get new bodies. And if we're alive on planet Earth when Jesus comes back to take his own to be with him forever, still this body is going to die if just for a moment. He's, and we're going to be raised to newness of life. We're going to have a new body fit for eternity. Thank God. Amen. Aren't anybody glad you're not going to live in this body forever? Amen. Peter says in verse 25, and he he reaches back to the words of King David a thousand years before Jesus came. David has this talk with God, and Peter reaches back and quotes King David in this conversation with God about Jesus to show this crowd in Jerusalem, to show them Jesus is the Messiah. And he says, Peter says, King David, verse 25, said this about him, about God. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. David says, no wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One, Jesus, David already knew. You will not allow your son Jesus to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. As the song says, Jesus' love is deeper and higher and wider and stronger. Our team is going to do a very special song at the end of this service when I'm done sharing here for a little while, they're going to come and do a powerful song. You see, when Jesus was on the earth, they tried to keep him down. Sometimes it's good to go back and rehearse what we know and what many of us have heard. They tried to keep Jesus down. They couldn't. Jesus knew what it was like to experience poverty. In fact, he was born in a barn, laid in a feeding trough, a manger, Mary and Joseph had to flee the country after he was born so his life could be spared. But you couldn't keep him down. Jesus knew what it was like to experience exhaustion and betrayal and grief. But you can't keep a good man down. Jesus knew what it was like to be tempted and to experience tremendous suffering and to be crucified a horrendous death, but even that couldn't keep him down. Jesus even knew what it was like to be forsaken by his Father, God. God the Father had to turn his face away from his Son while he, on the cross, Jesus became sin. He never sinned, but he took your sins, he took my sins. I have to make it personal. He took my sins on the cross. 
He became, though he never sinned, he became sin. And the Father, the eternal Father who had the eternal Son, who was always there, had to turn. It's hard to comprehend. He became sin, naked on Calvary's cross, suspended between all of heaven, all of heaven and all of earth, alone, and even his father turns away. But still, you can't keep a good man down. In case you haven't figured it out, the message today is entitled, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. You probably figured that out. We're smart Midwesterners. Three things could not keep Jesus down that I want to highlight. There's more, but there's three things I want to highlight. Number one, if you have your outline, people could not keep Jesus down. Let me read that verse again as Peter preached in Acts 2.23. But God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. Jesus came to his own. Peter Peter knows who he's talking to here. These, These Jewish people and he's preaching there in Israel and 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 he's saying, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Even his own brothers doubted his divinity until after the death and resurrection did they fully get on board. His own disciples that walked with him for over three years struggled at times. One betrayed him and one denied him. When he went to his hometown, the Bible tells us, to preach in his hometown, they said, is this the son of Joseph? The Bible says he couldn't do miracles in his own hometown because of their unbelief. They didn't understand who he was. I don't want to insult anybody here today, but it's possible that there are people here today that don't really know who Jesus is. But if we will choose to believe with the faith he's given us to believe, he'll do the greatest miracle that could ever happen. As great as the resurrection, he could do it in your life today. But unbelief held Jesus back in his own hometown from doing miracles. Unbelief. After his crucifixion and burial, his disciples even fled and hid, the Bible says. They were fearful. They were angry. They were frustrated. They were discouraged. They doubted. And they were questioning what, has tra- what had transpired in our lives with Jesus for these past three plus years. But nobody could keep him down. Secondly, death couldn't keep Jesus down. Acts 2.24, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 53, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Praise God. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Yes, our natural bodies, our physical bodies are going to die. I'm going to bury one of our beloved members on Tuesday. 
and went home to be with Jesus. And we're not having a funeral because he was a child of the king. We're going to put his old body in the grave, but we're going to, we're going to have a promotion service. He's going to be promoted to glory. And old Roger's doing better than any of us right now to be absent from this body for a child of God that is a believer that truly has received all that Jesus made possible for us on the cross. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. For a child of God, death for a child of God, death is just a transition from a temporal world to one that is permanent. For a child of God, death is just a transition. We go from life that has pain to a life that has no pain. We go from a life that has sorrow to one that has no sorrow, the Bible says. Jesus put an end to the agony of sickness, decay, age, and death. That didn't mean much to me 30 years ago, Kathy, when I was 34 and invincible and never thought about dying. Now I think about it once in a while. In fact, it was impossible for Jesus to be held in death's power. Try to create a visual in your mind as I read this scripture to you. Matthew 27, start at verse 62. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. And they told him, sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive, talking about Jesus, while he was still alive. After three days, he said, I'll rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. And I love what Pilate says next. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. What an impossible task that was. So, verse 66, they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. In light of who Jesus is, that cracks me up. They did all they knew how to secure the stone. In fact, when Mary Magdalene came, her problem was trying to figure out how she was going to see Jesus so she could anoint his body because of the stone. But when Jesus arose, the stone in front of the tomb rolled away. And by the time Mary gets there, God's angels who looked like men, the Bible says, are sitting there where he had been laid. God seems to take the biggest problems in our life and just sits on them. And the stone represents our sins that were rolled away. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, Calvary family. I know we've got guests in the room, but go ahead and say amen once in a while like we always do when it's not Resurrection Sunday. I know we're a little stiff, and I know I found me a tie to put on today, but still, we got something to shout about around here. We got the happy hope that heckles heathens, the faith that fosters fondest friendships, Jesus whom to know his life more abundantly. I mean, some, a lot of people been shouting about some March Madness basketball games around here. Them same people sit on their hands in the house of God when Jesus rose from the dead. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Well, we shouldn't get carried away. We're in church. Shh. 
We're only talking about eternal life here. And I'm going to get me an extraterrestrial suit. Fit for eternity. I'm not going to hear from these knees ever again. Hallelujah. They had an impossible assignment, those guards containing Jesus. Make it as secure as you can. Death could not keep our Lord down. The tomb couldn't imprison, imprison him either. And it gets better. People couldn't keep Jesus down. Death couldn't keep Jesus down. Let me give you one more for today. Satan could not keep Jesus down. Peter said the devil who fell from heaven has wanted power and supremacy, but he could not keep the Lord down. Our text again in verse 27 says, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one. David is saying, God, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow Jesus to rot in the grave. When Jesus was born, we know that the devil tried to snuff out the life of Jesus with this narcissist king. He had all the male children killed, but God protected his son. At the Mount of Temptation, the devil tried to get Jesus to take a shortcut from the cross and not go all the way to Calvary, but it didn't work. Jesus said to Satan, get thee behind me. And even at the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Bible says before the next day when he was going to the cross and he goes to pray, the Bible says he is sweating, as it were, drops of blood, sweating blood. The capillaries in his body had exploded from the stress of what he knew because he was God the Son. He was not only a man, he was fully God and fully man, and he knew the plan of God, the redemptive plan. He knew what he had to endure, and his body was raking in emotional pain. And he's at the Garden of Gethsemane that I've had a chance to be at a few times, laying possibly on this stone that I had a chance to lay on. The olive trees that were there when he was there, are still alive today, these old trees. And in his humanity, for a moment, we see his humanity in Scripture, and he, and he lifts up to his father in prayer, and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This cup of woe, this cup of suffering, this cup of torment. But God the Father said to God the Son, Son, the sin of the world can only be paid by you. Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. And he goes to the cross. And before he breathes his last breath, the Bible says, probably with all that he had left in him, as he gets ready to breathe his last breath in his earthly body, before he dies, he reaches up and he says, it is finished. Meaning, the work that the Father has called the Son to do is completed. The work is done. In fact, when he ascends to the Father, the first thing he does when he goes to heaven is he sits down. Nowhere in the tabernacle, nowhere in the, in the presence of God in the, in the holy of holies or in the, in the holy place or the most holy place, nowhere was there a seat. 
for the priest to ever be seated because the work was never done. Now Jesus goes to the Father and he sits down. Satan thought when he cried, it's finished, I've won. The world is mine and everything in it is mine. Now I'm the king. Satan thought he got what he always wanted, but he missed it because Satan couldn't keep our Lord and Savior in the grave. You can't keep a good man down. And Jesus, the Bible says he went into hell and preached. He preached to the captives. Jesus preached in hell on the third day and he rose again. Satan did not accomplish his goal. Jesus is king. He's king now. He's king forever. And there's coming a time. There's coming a time when he'll take his church to be with him forever. Satan did not accomplish his goal. Satan is a defeated enemy, a defeated foe. And, and he's on a short leash and he knows it. So he's going to do everything he can to keep anybody in this room from surrendering to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to receiving the gift of salvation, to truly believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth that he is your Savior and your Lord. And for you to humble yourself before a mighty God and admit that you need a Savior, you need a Master, you, your way doesn't work, my way doesn't work, it's his way. Serve a great God. I love the verse in this song. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou Let me head to a close because they've got a wonderful song that I can't wait for you to hear, but I want to pray for those that are here today that need to surrender to Jesus. The church grew in tremendous proportions for two main reasons. Number one, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a game changer. Second, they had just come from the crucifixion and the resurrection and they had a mindset now as they see their risen Lord they now have this mindset that nothing is impossible. So what's the Resurrection Sunday? Today, here we are 2,000 plus years later. What's this all about? Pastor, what is this about for us? What's this about for today? Number one, Resurrection Sunday brings a different attitude about life. There's no problem that can overtake us if we've committed our lives and everything in our lives to the Lord. Challenges, yes, but we have tremendous hope. We belong to Jesus. You know, in pastoring this many years, you get to know a few people. You don't know everything that's going on in everybody's lives, but you get to come alongside a few people that have, that have suffered, have lost loved ones, have lost babies and grandbabies, 
have went through horrendous things with people that they care about and they themselves and things that we never saw coming and things that we don't know where to put it, don't know where to frame it. But here's what I know about people in this house who have committed their way to the Lord. Committing your way to the Lord doesn't mean that you don't have problems and challenges anymore. He's not a bridge over troubled water. He, he's a, he brings you through it. He brings you through the challenges. The Bible says we have a trust that, be go, that goes beyond our ability to understand that we can trust him even when we can't figure it out. When we don't know what God knows, we can trust him because nothing has ever caught him off guard. God has never looked to his son sitting there in heaven and say, I didn't see that coming. He has never had to do that one time. And he works through your choices and mine. We don't understand it because we've made some bad choices. We've done some bad things. And God still, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, will take everything, good, bad, and ugly. And the Bible says he has a way because he's God. He's a sovereign God. He'll turn it for our eternal good. Resurrection brings a different attitude about life. Secondly, Resurrection Sunday brings a different attitude about death. We look at death differently as a Christian. We view it as an immediate translation into the presence of the Lord. We exchange people who know the Lord Jesus Christ. They know that at death they are exchanging a temporary for a permanent. We exchange earth for heaven. We exchange. It's the great exchange. Death for a child of God has no grip on us. Thirdly, Resurrection Sunday brings a different attitude about God. Mary went to the Lord's borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. I often wondered, why was it a borrowed tomb? Because he wasn't going to need it long. Mary goes to see him at the borrowed tomb and he was gone and she was weeping profusely. And Jesus comes to her. She doesn't know it's him. You remember the story? She doesn't know it's him and she's crying. And he says to her, why are you crying? They've taken my master away. I don't know where he lays. I don't know where he's at. They've taken him away. And at that very moment, she's talking to Jesus, but she doesn't know it's him. And Jesus stops and he says her name. Mary. At that moment, she knows it's the Lord. She knows it's Jesus. Resurrection Sunday is more than a historical event that happened over 2,000 years ago. I want to tell you once again that Jesus wants to bring miracles today in this place right now. Miracles that are no less than the resurrection. Jesus wants to take people who are bound for sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he wants to, for you to trade all of that in for a savior, for a master, for a Lord, for life, eternal life. To trade in all of your plans that don't work out very well for his plan. That he created you for his purpose, not for your purpose. 
And his grace is sufficient to come alongside you right where you are. And you don't have to try to fix yourself because you can't. And you don't have to change yourself because you really can't. And he says, my love is so great, like the song says, that I can come right where you are and receive you as as my own. And now with my power in you, if you'll just humble yourself and believe and receive what I have for you, what I did for you on Calvary's cross, if you'll believe it, if you'll receive it, if you'll can truly confess me as your Savior and Lord, I'll give you all the power you need to live the life I've called you to live, and we're going to go on a journey together. And will you be perfect right now in your, in your soul or in your flesh? No. But your spirit's made new, comes into a relationship with God, and now you get on this journey of sanctification and you become more and more like the man or woman Jesus has always intended for you to be. So I want to pray. I put other scriptures in there, but I'm going to stop right there because I want time for this song. Team, will you come? And I want to pray. And I, I want to know right now, It's just us here. I'm not going to have you bow your heads. I'm not even going to have you come forward. I just want to know, are you ready? Are you ready? Satan will tell you every time, no, you're not ready. Satan will never tell you to not surrender your life to Jesus. You know what Satan does to our mind? He says, not now. Tomorrow. Some other time, not now, not today. But I wonder, you've heard the gospel today. Not the best preacher, but I've given you the gospel the best way I know how, trusting the Lord to fill in the gaps for you. And if you're here today and you need to commit your life to Jesus or recommit your heart to the Lord, If you need to write where you are in your seat, humble yourself before a a great God in your heart and mind, just humble yourself and say, Lord, look at me. It's like this. I need you, Lord. You might be wealthy here today by the world standards. You might have a nice vehicle, a nice house, a good job. You might, might have a, you might have more bragging rights than most people in this earth. But without Jesus, you're dying a sinner's death. You're going to be eternally separated from God. And nothing that you've achieved in this world will have any lasting value. But if today, God won't force you, he's a gentleman. He'll knock at the door, the door of your heart. You open the door or you don't. You decide to live for Jesus or not. And everyone here is gonna make that decision today. Every person here, you you can't ride the fence. It's either yes or no. You're saying yes to God or you're saying no to God. That's it. But how about you? Is this your moment? I want to pray a prayer of faith with everyone right where you are. I want to just pray. I'm going to ask everyone in this room to pray with me out loud, if you would. You don't have to, but if you would, for strength for those that might be for the first time saying, yes, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. Hey, before I pray, who who am I praying for? Who is this your time to commit your life or to recommit your life to the Lord? And you say, Pastor, it's me. I'm, I'm not having anybody bow your... I mean, Jesus died on a cross naked before the whole world. We can have a little bit of boldness to say, it's me, Pastor. I need Jesus. I need the Lord. Yes, I see your hand back here. Yes, God bless you, honey. God bless you. Yes, back here. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you. 
Yes, 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 I see your hand. I see your hand in the back. Lord bless you. Many hands. Yes, I see your hand. I see that little hand. Amen. You're waving it, making sure I see anybody else. Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. You can leave your hand down, but you're raising it up. This is my day. This is your spiritual birthday to be ushered into the very presence of the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's all stand. We're going to stand for this last song anyway. I want to pray. It's not how fancy the prayer is. It's what's going on in your heart. Would you repeat this prayer out loud? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me that I might live for you. I'm sorry that it was my sin that put you on the cross. I receive your forgiveness. I confess you as my Savior. Live in me, Lord. Make my heart brand new. I don't understand so many things, but with your help and your power, I'm going to learn more about you. I'm going to be a part of a life-giving church that tries to be real. As we grow together, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I belong to you. The devil can't have me no more. I belong to Jesus. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, I promise you the devil's going to try to steal what you just prayed from you. He's going to try to tell you this ain't real. It didn't really happen. But if you really believed in your heart, it wasn't just words, and you meant it, you meant it to the best of your ability. And the best of your ability isn't that great, by the way. But to the best of your ability, he fills in the gap. Point yourself towards him. Be a part of a life-giving church that preaches the truth. It's not trying to make it all cushy for you. Around here, we try to love people enough to, with grace and love and tact, tell it like the word says. We're not skipping hard verses. Be here. When the doors are open, get your tail to church. Because you need me and I need you. We need one another. God made it that way. We need him. We need each other. And when we mess up and we fail each other and we will, we forgive each other. How many people aren't in churches because of crazy preachers like me that messed them up and they don't want to go anymore? I want to tell you right on the front side, I'm not perfect. And he's got all kinds of problems. I was a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. I love you all. Let's sing this powerful song before we leave and we'll close in prayer.